So welcome to this virtual live symposium on innovation in mitral valve repair, where we're going to discuss uh, the new Edvars Pascal Transcatheter Valve Repair System. My name is Lars Sandergaard. I'm a cardiologist in Copenhagen. I'm chairing this session with Bernard Pendergast from London in the UK. We have Camillo Grasso from Catania in Italy, Jörg Hausleiter from Munich in Germany, and Stefan Baldus from Cologne in in, Munich, uh, in, in Germany as well, sorry. And um, the purpose of uh, today is to, um, to have a presentation of the Pascal system and to look at some of the data who actually led to the CMARC approval, which was granted in February 2019. We're going to Mainz to observe a live demonstration using the Pascal repair system. And then we're going to have two case presentation uh, on the Pascal system in a primary and in a secondary uh, mitral regurgitation. So this is uh, what we're going to do today here. And um, I think with not much further delay, uh, we're going to, to start with Camilo Grasso for the presentation of the Pascal system and the data from the CMARC study. Uh, Camilo, yeah. please. So good afternoon to everybody. I will talk about the uh, new Pascal system for repair, for transcatheter to repair of the mitral valve. Uh, we know that 2% uh, uh, of population uh, has uh, a, a mitral regurgitation, and it, uh, it, it, ups, uh, it goes uh, up to 10% in people uh, with older than 75 years old. And uh, among these people, the mortality is very high, and uh, at five years, the mortality reached 50%. Uh, and among the patient would survive uh, with medical therapy, 90% of this uh, patient uh, have been hospitalized for heart failure. For this purpose, a new system that is called Pascal Transcatheter Valve Repair System coming from uh, Edwards that recently uh, had the, the CE mark approval, uh, it consists uh, with an implant and a specific delivery system. The implanter is made by the central spacer intended to fill the regurgitant orifice area. And uh, the, the pedals, the contour pedals, the design are designed to reduce the stress on leaflets. And the clasps that allow for independent leaflet, this is a new feature, and capture and the ability to fine tune the leaflet position. The delivery system is made by the 22 French guys sheets and the steerable catheter inside which there is the implant catheter, the least the, the, the Pascal. And the design uh, permits a precise position of the implant and permits the maneuvering in three different planes to reach the exact point for the implantation. The Edward Pascal is designed for a, an optimized leaflet capture. It is designed for effective mitral, regurg the, the mitral regurgitation reduction and it is designed to uh, have a high profile of uh, safety. It is optimized for leaflet capture. It comes uh, with uh, a particular uh, feature. First of all, the independent maneuvering of the, the catheter, the guide catheter and the, uh, and the, the steering catheter uh, to reach each point of the valve to have a precise uh, positioning of, uh, uh, of the implant. Uh, and the independent leaflet capture. Uh, the, uh, the device has the capability to, to raise and to drop uh, the clasp independently. And then we can have two different uh, kind of, uh, um, of uh, clasping. One is the first on the, on the left that is called a st staged leaflet capture, in which you can uh, uh, clasp uh, uh, first the posterior, for example, the posterior retracted leaflet, and then move towards the anterior leaflet. And the other feature is the, it is called a leaflet capture adjustment. So when you do a clasping, but you are not so, um, so happy with the final result, and then you can open just one clasp and adjust the, uh, the clasping and then close again uh, the device. And it is defined, uh, designed for effective uh, mitral regurgitation reduction. Uh, the paddle are very broad and maximize the leaflet cooptation, and the central spatial is designed to fill the regurgitant orifice area and facilitates uh, leaflet cooptation. And we know that increased cooptation area lengths are predictor of the successful MR reduction. And safety features uh, uh, 
are designed to, to reduce leaflet stress. The paddle profile enables soft leaflet capture, the spacer reduces the leaflet stress, and the contoured pedals conform leaflet to spacer. And another feature that is very important is the elongation of, uh, of the implants. If you are into the ventricle in a subvalvular uh, position and you need to, to, to remove or to retract the implant, you can elongate it and you can safe uh, maneuver it uh, uh, even uh, among the, the cord, avoid entangling on the cord. The first experience of, uh, of the Pascal repair system exam comes with the first in human experience. It was conducted in eight hospitals in five countries, and uh, uh, they enrolled 29 high risk or uh, inoperable uh, patients uh, that were symptomatic with severe uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, the etiology was uh, mixed, so what we have the functional, degenerative, or mixed uh, etiology. The anatomical complexity uh, uh, was uh, uh, unable and uh, um, unsuitable for any other devices. The events at 30 days, we have a good technical success on 97%, so in almost uh, uh, all patients, and the mortality, despite uh, the complexity of the population, was uh, uh, low at 30 days, was 10%, uh, with uh, uh, three patients with uh, died for cardiovascular mortality and one, uh, two patients rehospitalized for heart failure. And at six point, the, 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 the results uh, were sustained uh, with 18% uh, of all cause mortality and uh, two uh, patients that underwent reintervention for mitral valve dysfunction. One of these patients was repaired uh, by adding another uh, Pascal device. These are the results. And uh, you can see clearly that uh, uh, at six months, the NIA class was 100% uh, uh, below, uh, below three. So in NIA class one and two, uh, all uh, the patients, and 90% uh, of patients were with MR less than two at six months. Even uh, if we talk about functional, uh, uh, functional tests, so the six-minute walking test improved after six months, and we, the patient gained uh, a medium, a delta of uh, 100 meters. And uh, even from a, um, an echocardiographic point of view, we, uh, we noticed an, an improvement in left uh, ventricular ejection fraction and uh, remodeling at six months. So in conclusion, with the first in human study, we can say the percutaneous repair with the Edward Pascal transcatheter valve repair uh, was feasible and safe in high-risk inoperable patients. Among 29 patients, the technical success were very high, and it was uh, reached 97%. And despite the anatomical complexity in the first in human patient, uh, the um, reintervention rate at six months was very low. 9%. So MR reduction and clinical improvements were sustained at six months. And then it comes the CLASP study. The CLASP study was the study that leads the CE mark uh, about one, uh, one month ago. And it was uh, a prospective multicenter single arm study uh, with the purpose to assess the safety, performance, and clinical outcome of uh, the Pascal system. It enrolled 62 patients in 14 uh, sites worldwide. And uh, the AMR severity baseline was moderate to, to severe in almost 60% uh, of patients, and MR was severe in 41% of patients. Uh, almost all patients were implanted. The, the, the rate was very high, 95%. And major adverse event rate was uh, uh, low, uh, as low as 4.8%. MR reduction, as assessed by the core lab, was at discharge, 95% uh, of patients were with uh, myocardial regurgitation, my, mitral regurgitation less than two, and at 30 days, uh, uh, the, the percentage improved uh, to uh, uh, 98%. So in this experience, the Pascal Trascatheter repair system uh, was safe and performed as intended in patients with clinical significant mitral regurgitation. Thank you, Camilio. This was excellent. Uh, as you heard, um, the Pascal system had the CMARC approval, uh, I think it was February 19, so a little more than a month ago. But we're very lucky. We have uh, two operators here who have tried it. Uh, Jörg Hausleiter, uh, you have tried it. Uh, so maybe you can 
can try to explain some of the difference between the mitre clip system and the Pascal system we used to talk about arms and grippers. Now we have to talk about uh, paddles, uh, clasps, uh, spaces. So what is the main difference between these two technology and, and how can you see this can going to make an, a difference in the efficacy uh, in treating patients with mitral regurgitations? Well, as Carmelo already pointed out, is the following that this system has several features which allows to reduce the MR very effectively. Some of these additional features compared to the mitral clip is the broader width of the system <clears throat> that allows a better distribution of the pulling forces on the leaflets and then also the possibility, and I, I'm sure we will see this also today in, in more detail, the possibility to individually um, work with one arm or the other one so, so that you can have the possibility to individually grasp one leaflet or the other or you can also use this feature to optimize uh, your initial result, and that it, at the end will reduce the MR very efficiently. So you say it's uh, the, the paddle is a broader is broader than the arms in the in the mitral clip system. Can you put some numbers on what what are we talking about wide and length of these two systems? Well, that, that is very easy to answer because the uh, the Pascal system has about the double the width of of the mitral clip, so it's about 10 millimeters in width. And in terms of arm length, it is very, very good comparable to the XT system um, of the mitral clip. So we have pretty long arms, which allows to uh, capture a lot of leaflets into the system, into the device, which will then effectively um, um, reduce the MR by having a good co-optation in, in, in the Pascal system of both leaflets. And, and we have this spacer between uh, the two uh, paddles and, uh, and the clasps. So, so, so how is that going to make a difference? Do you see, is, is it? Well, the, <clears throat> the theory behind this is that, that we have the spacer which is filling this, um, this gap between the leaflets. And if we then attach the, uh, the leaflets to the spacer, we are, we are thinking that this will improve the co-optation also and will, at the end, as I said, reduce the MR. So, Stefan, um, safety has been one of the character for the mitre clip system. It's, it's been a very safe procedure. Um, is there anything which can, can change the safety outcome from, with the Pascal system compared to the mitre clip? Any features which uh, you, you see makes a difference? Well, just in general, I guess we have to say that the, the system is, is very similar to what we are used to, and, and it, it can be assumed that safety should be at least as good as for uh, the established devices. What I think what is intriguing is the fact that we have the possibility of elongation in a position where we don't want to have uh, the system in the end. So um, the, the, the risk of entanglement for example, if you are very commercial with your placement, the risk of entanglement by getting it easier out of the ventricle due to the possibility to elongate the system is probably something which, which might be very helpful and may, might increase safety overall. We, we're going to come back uh, to this elongation a little bit later to show some of the, the recorded cases at least. Can, can you try to explain what, what do you mean about elongation and, and what, is, what is the technique and what is the difference from what we actually do in, <laughs> with the mitoclip? We're talking about you want to bring the system back from the left ventricle to the left atrium. So, so, exactly. so just explain what is this elongation with the Pascal system? Uh, so basically what you did uh, or do with the mitoclip is you do an inversion. And um, uh, by this, you expose um, potentially um, harmful material and surfaces towards uh, the cordae and the leaflet system. With the Pascal system, you have an ent entire uh, system uh, which is, in a way, shielded by its design, which prevents from being entangled in these uh, delicate uh, situations. Jörg was telling us this system is, is wider. It's about 10 millimeter compared to the 5 millimeter with the mitre clip. Um, uh, we have seen with the mitre clip, with the XT system, XTR system, that it's easier to, to get a good grasp, but also it can actually imply some risk that you tear the leaflets. 
Do you see the same risk here with the Pascal system with really broad uh, paddles that uh, you have a risk of, of leaflet tearing? Well, I think we, we don't know yet, given the limited uh, extent of experience we have. But theoretically, as, as Jörg just pointed out, I would also agree upon the fact that given the, the increased width of the system and given the spacer, we might be able to reduce stress from the leaflets, which might make it safer. We, yeah. we have to wait and have to see whether this yeah. is the case. So, so in the Mainz Eclipse system, we have all these uh, small hooks or uh, uh, spikes down the arms, which is attaching to the leaflets. Is it different here? Or is it the same with, with the Pascal system uh, on, on, the, on the clasps? Uh? Well, it's reduced. I mean, you have, you have, you have less of these uh, systems which actually impact on, on uh, leaflet tissue. But as we will probably see, we have, we have nice visualization of, of the captured leaflets uh, with uh, the clasps being lowered. And, and uh, from what we know so far, this is efficient enough to keep, uh, keep the leaflets in place. That's great. Thank you, Stefan. So I think we are ready now to go to Mainz in Germany uh, to Stefan uh, von Badeleben and his team to watch a live case. Uh, Stefan, are you with us? We are ready. We are with yeah, you. We re are you ready? And we are ready, yes. Yeah. So um, please. Yeah. So, Stefan, you, you can just start now and present your team and your case. Okay, we're on. Okay, warm welcome from the Hardware Center in Mainz, uh, Germany. And I'm here with the whole team. To my right side is Felix Kreidel, who will do the procedure with me. My name is Stefan von Bartleben. We have a team together with Tobias Roof, who is on the Echo, together with a colleague from Canada, uh, Dr. Kuma. We have a good cardiovascular anesthesiology team and uh, the expert team from Edwards uh, for the Pascal. Uh, so what you see is that we simply just introduced the sheath. We haven't begun with the procedure. We would now like to make you acquainted with the patient details of the specific patient we prepared for you today. Also a warm welcome from my side. Let me quickly introduce you to the patient. Next slide, please. This is a fairly young only 49-year-old male patient that presented with severe symptoms of heart failure due to a dilated cardiomyopathy and a severe symptomatic functional mitral regurgitation. His dilated cardiomyopathy was diagnosed last year and despite optical, optimal medical therapy, the patient is presenting in New York Heart Class 3 in the moment. Other histories is HIV infection, and for the dilated cardiomyopathy, he was treated with a subcutaneous ICD last year. CRT was no option with a QRS of only 100 milliseconds. Next slide, please. This is his four-chamber view, clearly depicting severe biventricular disease with a very dilated left vent ventricle and an ejection fraction that was calculated with 20% and a tapsy of not more than 11 millimeters. Next slide, please, which is showing the far uh, color Doppler jet of the functional mitral regurgitation. Vena contractor width in this four chamber view was measured to be seven millimeters. EROA was calculated to be 0 0.33 square centimeters. Next slide. We're now looking at the geometry morphology of the mitral valve by TE you can appreciate a really severely tethered posterior mitral leaflet and also heavy tethering of the anterior mitral leaflet that would translate to a cooptation depth of 11 millimeters. Annulus actually was dilated but not severely dilated with an AP diameter of 36 millimeters and an intercommissural diameter of 38 millimeters. Next slide, please. This is 3D rendering and you may want to focus on the very heavy tethering of the posterior mitral leave that that you can actually hardly see in this view. Next slide. So heart team discussion was obviously engaged and intense in this very young patient with severe symptomatic FMR. Um, his primary uh, sickness, of course, the dilated cardiomyopathy. We couldn't actually do anything for him now. Recent myocardial biopsy showed that there was no acute or chronic inflammation anymore. CATD, as I mentioned, was no option. So we focused on his functional MR and felt this 
he was really a, a, a patient with very high risk for surgical intervention. And if you look at the ACA trial, um, surgical repair, we felt, was really no option. And in this young patient, a percutaneous approach, we felt, was the preferable uh, way to go on. Next slide, please. So our heart team actually voted, next slide, please, voted for leaflet therapy. And of course, it was interesting discussion to to then uh, that led to Pascal. And uh, we are very eager also ourselves to see how this device performs in this patient with heavy leaflet tethering. And while we're listening to you, the discussion, of course, is um, leaflet injury. And we felt that in this patient, a very subtle interaction with the leaflets was, uh, should be an advantage. Next slide. So this translates to a strategy with a pretty central cooptation deficit. And we think that we can treat this FMR with one central device. Stefan, handing it back to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Felix. And I think uh, we can shortly discuss this patient, but also have a look in the images. And we'd just like to show you that we did uh, some fusion techniques, but also have live images from the table. And Tobias, would you please just show five uh, slides? So we can highly appreciate in this slide already that we have a distinct difference between the closing line of the mitral valve, which is in the ventricle, and which is even a little bit more than those 11 millimeters in the ventricle on the left-hand side. You can also see that an annual plus T would override the posterior leaflet on both sides and may even aggravate uh, the gap in the leaflets. On the other hand, we see uh, that there is a, a pseudoprolapse, which is, of course, volume dependent in this patient. And also the landing zone, if the discussion goes for a cardio band, was that we have on the uh, upper right-hand side and left image, we have the circumflex artery just in the hinge point landing area. So these are, of course, also options to discuss uh, to keep every intervention open. We felt that even the Pascal implantation today will keep, of course, a surgical replacement technique or another technique later open. So we wanted to overcome this severe tethering. We wanted to get uh, a lot of leaflet stress off the leaflet. So the central spacer, I think, in functional disease is a very good idea. And we want to show you this. Uh, so I think we have an interesting but also uh, doable candidate where a restrictive anal plus T, in my opinion, is not an option. So, Stefan, thank you very much indeed. It's Bernard Prendergast here. You, it's very clearly presented a uh, set of clinical circumstances and exquisitely beautiful imaging. So thank you very much indeed for that. And I've just got two very simple questions for you. Um, the patient's been on long-term treatment for their HIV disease. Is there any coronary artery disease at yes. all? Or does he have normal coronary arteries? Absolutely. Nothing to report. They were looked at and we also have a recent biopsy. It was thought that the patient had a history of prior myocarditis, but very long in the past, years ago. And we had a re-biopsy uh, just within the last two months. And there is no active inflammation in this patient causing actually the disease progression. So we specifically looked for that. And also, um, you've already, you're already thinking ahead in this young patient about the concept of complementary therapy. But if you didn't Absolutely. have Pascal, if we can ask you that question, <coughs> which device do you think would be the optimal choice in the absence of Pascal? And what difference is Pascal making for this specific patient? I think, of course, we have a huge experience in mind with the uh, other edge-to-edge -edge system, which was already mentioned, the MitraClip system. And, of course, an XTR system would be another choice. You see that the uh, tissue of the leaflets is from a 50-year-old patient, so rather, we hope, rather stable. We have no calcification whatsoever, neither in the coronaries, but also not on the rings, so the annulus should still be pliable. But it was already mentioned that the uh, strong shortening of the AP diameter may also cause leaflet stress and may also cause perforations or injuries to the leaflet. So here, the idea to have a central spacer that does not totally overcome and put together the interior and posterior leaflet. So we don't want to do an analplasty in this patient as we're slightly below uh, four centimeters in diameter. 
So here it was intriguing to use the central spacer and try to have this to overcome leaflet stress for years uh, for this rather young patient. That's very clear, thank you. So we've got two expert uh, operators here as well in, in terms of exposure to the Pascal device, Jorg and Stefan. Do you have any particular comments in relation to this case, the advantages of Pascal for this specific anatomy? Well, I think that, that Felix and Stefan van Badelim very nicely pointed out uh, that this patient obviously is not a good patient for direct annuloplasty. So, um, and, and given the severity of disease, an interventional technique is obviously the way to go. And uh, given uh, th these uh, prerequisites, I think uh, this is probably a very good candidate uh, for Pascal as well. And with these very highly mobile leaflets, Jörg, do you think the, the facility for individual leaflet capture and readjustment will be particularly useful? Oh, yeah, especially in this very tethered posterior leaflet, I think that the Pascal um, system has some additional features which might be beneficial at the end to really successfully reduce the EMR. And I, I'm sure that Stefan will show us how to optimize the result with this independent grasping. Okay. Uh, last, do you have any remaining questions? <clears throat> no, I think it's, uh, it was a nice demonstration. So, um, so let's go back to, to you, Stefan, and, and show us what you have done, and maybe also focus a bit on the handle the steering system. And tell us a little bit about Absolutely. the setup, so, Stefan, in terms of the puncture and the atrial pressure monitoring, yes. your, your routine for, for mitral procedures such as this. Okay, sure. Sure. The, the patients, of course, come with a facing state, so uh, the volume depletion often is uh, relatively prominent. So we have um, LA pressure, which is just around 15 millimeters mercury. I just want to show you some, some examples of this patient that you simply can see them. You can nicely see the probe in. You see a rotation here at the transeptal puncture, which is done at uh, approximately uh, 4.5 centimeters above the AV line. Um, we also looked, of course, for the devices. You see here the wire, uh, and on the uh, lower right side, you can see uh, the uh, defibrillator, cardioverter defibrillator, which is implanted in this uh, specific patients. What we can also show you is just if the regie can just Im uh, show the short video um, for the um, system, how we aligned actually the echo image with the fluoroscopy system. You'll see that. Uh, now, and we can use this actually to perfectly align with the annular plane without taking any contrast or any other measurements. And this is all real time that you see there. So the whole effort is 30 seconds without any contrast being involved in this patient. And you can see that we have an automatic analysis of all the chambers, right and left heart, which are pretty precise and help us to see uh, when we steer down now to steer the left atrial appendage to see the ring size, etc. So this is just a short teaser to show you. What we've done is that we did this transeptal puncture. We only introduced the sheath so far, not the device yet. So we'll go in with the steerable catheter. You can nicely see in the images that we have um, the aorta uh, in position. We can control this. I can go a little bit to a more REO projection and you can nicely see that the yellow triangle gives us the direction of the left upper pulmonary vein and we also see the left atrial appendage to come down to the mitral mitral valve so all this information is here for free after a calibration uh, period of 30 seconds and we now move up the device and we'll then show the handling here's the pascal coming into the left atrium and you can nicely see that device coming out in 3D echo, we see the wall. So I simply flex the system more, and then I will pull back the sheath. So I'm in next to the wall with the device, and the straddling technique is to move forward and to pull back the sheath. And by doing so, the device stays absolutely beautifully stable without touching any wall. And you may see the small radio pack marker that gives me the end of the uh, spacer. And actually, we will increase the quality of the fluoro a little bit here. And I hope the transmission is good enough to nicely show you in this magnification, actually, the device in a high resolution quality. 
And what Felix is now doing, he will shorten the system in bringing out the petals and bringing it into a, a leaflet grasp position. So he is now turning, other way, turning clockwise, please, closing the system. Uh, and you can nicely see how the system unfolds. We can turn it in this position easily just to show you the device. Now you see it nicely. And this would be the position that we take later on uh, to do the leaflet capture. At the moment, the two clasps are down. And we'll later show above the valve how these clasps are being opened and closed. So Felix, could you please further go close the uh, pedals and the clasps? He is closing it. Closing it around the spacer. Until you hear sound. Again. Okay. And here you go. And now raise the clasps, please. Does the camera see that? I'm Inside. raising the clasps. Okay. They are connected. Yeah. So we're done. You can see and appreciate that now the system is ready for steering. We're much shorter now. And we're able to go into a projection that gives us the mitral plane. And for educational reasons, you nicely see this mitral plane. And uh, we can simply adapt the fluoro to look perpendicular now, perfectly perpendicular to the mitral plane. And we'll use this to show you. So the direction, the insert direction to the left pulmonary vein is the white triangle, as you see. The, LA, the left atrial appendage is just below. And the mitral valve is from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. So what we can nicely show you now that is we pull or we push the catheter out of the steerable sheath and we now begin to flex. We're near the pulmonary vein as you see here and we're flexing down to the mitral valve. I can steer this interior and posterior, see nicely, down the mitral valve and I can do this in a single motion. You see, it's very easy and we already reached the mitral valve. This is a approximately 10 second maneuver. And I can also flex the cerebral guide catheter. What we can do now with the device is to move medial as I do now. Just look on the echo, please. I can move anterior by a short counterclockwise movement or posterior by a clockwise movement of the cerebral catheter. Can you see that? So it's pretty much a very good controlled and stable maneuvering capability. We'll now turn the clip clockwise approximately 20 degrees and we'll then do the opening test of the device. I unflex a little bit to keep it above the valve. I keep it a little bit more interior. Okay. Can they connect us? So Felix, could you please we're above the valve, as we see here. Can you control this in biplane? We go to an LAO, and we'll now test the device with direct double or independent clasping. So again, we can use the system, actually the model, to see this. Look on the pure fluoro image below. And Felix has one system anterior and one posterior. So we'll now open the clip again, uh, the clasp. Uh, the pedals on the. We'll now open it. You see, elongated. Stop. Okay. So now, if the camera is catching this, there's two sliders on the handle of the implant catheter. Look at the echo images too, and With Felix will now first do the two clasps together. So we will lower the clasp so to the catch the leaflets. Two yeah. slides together. Yeah, somebody's calling us. I don't hear yeah. you. Uh, can Stefan. we get the sound up? Stefan? Yes. Can, can you just yes, pause for you. Can, can you pause for, for a moment and just show us the different features yes, of the handle, how you actually operate it? Can we have that on a big oh, screen? Yes, yeah. please, I do. Yeah. Can we move down? If you're on a big screen, I see it. So can we just focus here on the handle, please, on this side? Okay. So everybody who is doing Tabor will recognize certain elements of this system. So, so basically, this handle part, which is the sheath, resembles very much the commander system uh, of the Sapien 3. You see there's a single steering knob which controls the flex option 
which is also seen here in this little window. This is a plastic window where we can see how much we flex the sheaf. And as I flex it, I move in this direction uh, as far as I turn either medial or I can elevate the Pascal system or I can also correct a posterior or anterior puncture. Here you see, if we go in here, you see unflexed would be something up here. Now I'm going to the unflexed position. See it here? And now I'm flexing. And you see that the little black marker moves with it. This is the control directly at the septum. Now, the basic steering is actually done a little bit more down here. And this is a second catheter which behaves the same, but controls the steering catheter. I have a little fin here, like a shark fin, as you see here, and, and here I have a flush port. Typically, I control this flush port at a four o'clock direction, and this fin at a one to three o'clock direction. So moving, as you see in echo, moving clockwise puts me posterior. See that in echo? I'm now on the posterior ring. No, wait, they don't, they're not okay, seeing the echo. Can we split the screen to yeah, see your hands on the echo? echo. The echo. Yes. Perfect, thank okay, you. Okay, now I'm posterior. Everybody sees that. And now I go anterior, and this is a counterclockwise rotation. Now I'm going anterior. Everybody sees this? It's a very mild rotation. I'm just moving about two hours back and forth. Can you see this? Yeah, we can see that. Very clear, thank okay. you. Very clear and smooth. And now I control the lateral and medial position, and this is the black knob here. Here I can bend the steering catheter, and I do this for you. And as you see, I'm moving to the medial side. Now I'm medial, you see that? Yeah. If I unflex, which is a counterclockwise rotation, I can move to the lateral position. See that? Yeah. Now I'm next to the left atrial appendage. So, so your okay, puncture sorry. site in the septum, is that the same as you would use for a mitre clip system, or is there any difference? Yes. Yes, uh, I would try, as with the newer mitre clip systems, I would try to have a puncture site between four and five centimeters. So we can forget with the new systems, actually a puncture site that is below four centimeters. It's not beneficial. You have to do a lot of maneuvers to get higher up. So I would recommend in any etiology now, to go between four and five centimeters above the AV valve in a four chamber view. I would always recommend to use the posterior third of the septum. So never puncture anterior, no aorta hugging, but please take at least the middle, but I would recommend to take the last third, the posterior third in a short axis, 45 to 60 degree view, in order to obtain maximum steerability of the devices. But it's the same for the mitre clip and the Pascal system. And also when you, when you introduced the, the Pascal control. system, uh, Stefan, it looked like it was elongated and, and then you actually, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, so yes. It, to, 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 uh, to push it in the sheath, we elongate yeah. the Pascal device and then we shorten it, it becomes thicker. So in, an, in a shortened position, you couldn't pull it back into the sheath. You can only pull it back in the sheath in an elongated position. An elongated is very open position. Yes. Yeah. So when it's elongated, you want to go back to the normal yeah. shape, you start closing the device. We just would like to show you the turning, the rotation of the clip system, so, and to, to open and control the class. So what Felix is doing now, he's turning it counterclockwise. You see? Now it's counterclockwise in the echo. Are you seeing see the it? echo? Yeah. And now yeah, he's turning yeah. it clockwise, and I have to react a little bit here on the steering catheter. So unlike, the Pascal system is an unkeyed system, so we don't have rails. So the whole steerability uh, is available in any procedure, which also means that we have some interaction between the two or three catheters. That's important to recognize. Now we want to show you the independent clasping, and uh, perhaps we first look from above, and we have a high resolution here, 18 volumes per second, 3D, and we'll nicely show this. We start with the interior side, which should be in the echo, the lower position. Exactly, the two sliders, <coughs> one for each clasp, are now connected with this white knob. And if I lift them up a little and- We need fluoro for it. Can you include fluoro as an image? Fluoro, please. We, fluoro? we see fluoro. 
Yeah, okay. we, you get a bigger fluoro. Can we get a second inlay image of fluoro alone? Conventional fluoro. Well, we we do, do it again. Fluoro. See that? Yes, this looks nice. Do it one so more time, now we do it again. Clasps down. Yes. Bo both, See that? Both clasps are up. I'm pushing down to both sliders and both claps are going down. Is this good to see? It's very clear, thank you. I was going to ask oh, Carmelo. Carmelo, you, you've done many hundred uh, mitroclip implantations. This system is quite different. It's, it's still a, a three-dimensional array of movements and controls. But do you see this being easier for newcomers to the field? Well, the, the, the system seems to be easier to use because of the independence of, uh, of the, the, the catheters can maneuver. You, you have a lot of, uh, of space of, um, of maneuvering. So you can adjust even, uh, uh, for example, in a, in a wrong puncture uh, side, you can raise uh, the, the height of the system by straightening the, the guiding catheter. Mm. So I think that has some features that uh, makes the, the, the procedure a little bit easier. OK. So, Stefan, we don't want to delay you. We're mindful we of the time, so please proceed. Right. Yeah. Just, just exactly. short independent grasping. I think this clasping, this is very important. We now remove the pin, which is a security pin between the two clasps. So I now, will now show independent clasping. So I first take the one that is facing us, and I lift it up a little, and then we need fluoro. Yeah, fluoro. So, and in the 3D echo, you can nicely see it's the clasp that faces the aorta. It's anterior. So that is, this slider facing us is moving the anterior clasp. And correspondingly, the other one, which I'm using now. You see it back. Can you zoom in and echo a little bit, please? It's the upper one. We go a little bit larger in echo. See that? And it's okay. the second one. This was independent clasping of the two sides of the, of the Pascal. And we, and we leave this pin just aside because it's also easy to use them both without having them connected. Okay, we'll slightly close the system now. The clasps are up. We're ready actually to do a procedure, so we will close them slightly. I will now go back into a perpendicular view, which you see here. So we'll arrange the fluoroscopy slightly. And you see already that we are, if we are perpendicular, we already look onto the, both pedals of the, of the Pascal system very simultaneous, if you regard fluoroscopy, please. So in fluoroscopy, you see, we can see through both pedals uh, in the specific patient. So what we now would do is we steer to the optimal central position and uh, we would do, then do the leaflet grasp and look whether one device is sufficient. Otherwise, we would go for two devices. So what we're doing here is that uh, Tobias is actually trying to achieve a symmetric uh, view to the intercommissural view on the left-hand side. You can nicely see that we see in the middle the anterior leaflet and to both sides heavily, heavily tethered uh, P1 and P3 leaflets. We're looking with the device, and I'll show you the trajectory of movement. We're looking with the device directly to the apex, and we're turning it a little bit counterclockwise. And this is a movement that Felix will control. So Felix, if you could just simply move slightly uh, counterclockwise, please. We have no more 3D. We need 3D. I'm putting the Pascal above above the leaflets. The Pascal is partially closed. I open so it a little so we can better... You see it better? Okay, do you see that? Now get rid of it a little bit of the, of the proximal gain. And we now have to go into the middle of the valve. So I'm unflexing slightly. I'm putting myself into the middle and I'm asking Felix to turn now clockwise. Do you see that? And now I can move the system in and out slightly. And as you can see, we already have movements here on the valve. So you can slightly go counterclockwise. Actually, we're fine. Can we reduce respiratory support a little bit? The, only the amplitude, please. And uh, otherwise, we're fine. OK. You see now the leaflet arms on the right-hand side. And we stay slightly open. It's fine. We can also use that. 
and we now go in. So the projection plane, if we enlarge the images, you see that we use actually uh, the fluoroscopy system to perfectly control the rotation. So I take this image and I save this to a second screen. So I always have the impression of how the, uh, the, the Pascal system is correctly aligned. This is very important with the system as all movements may also influence slightly the rotation. So the most important part that also Felix will control now is why I do fluoroscopy during the movement into the ventricle is to control actually the rotation uh, of the Pascal system when I go in. Okay, so we're happy here. I slightly relax some, some flex. You see, I'm moving immediately to the lateral side. I have to control this, we go down. And can we switch to a biplane, please? This looks perfect. Okay, and we will go into the valve. I take respect of the two papillary muscles. You see the movement of the heart with the respiration. It's still relatively intense here. Habt ihr die Beatmungsamplitude ein bisschen runtergestellt? Wirklich? Ja, also so 30 Prozent runter, bitte. I pull out the system slightly. I have to give flex again. Guck die Rotation. And I'm going into the ventricle. Trying to avoid the cords. I'm in the ventricle. And we immediately move back. Warte, das müssen wir dran. Wir müssen gleich gucken. Es ist gedreht. So, muss. Ja, ich hab, musst du die Können wir bitte 3D nochmal machen? How can we have 3D to control this? No, but we need, hmm? needed to change the projection yeah. plane because it was behind the subcutaneous ICD. We couldn't see it. We turned the... We're in the intercortical free space, mm -hmm. and we turned it slightly clockwise. Go back a little bit. You see the Pascal is nicely orientated, but a little weniger. Zurück. We now rotate back a little bit. And you see we're coming to the trajectory. And what we do is that I move up now to the leaflet to support both the tethered and the other leaflet, so the interior leaflet here. Stefan, it's, uh, it's Carmelo speaking. So here you see a big advantage of the system. I have the interior leaflet on, and what we will show you now is actually to grasp only the interior side first. Let's see, I'm, I'm going there a little bit more interior. Okay. I'm heavily in. I'm he now put up. the clasp down and only the interior leaflet is caught. Okay, I didn't catch the very tethered posterior leaflet. And you see that also the clasp is moving with the leaflet. It's a very nice sign that the leaflet is in. Now I have a totally different trajectory in the tethered posterior leaflet. And what I will do now is both to, can you show me 3D that we're not too medial? We'll have a look. 3D again. A little bit, the movement of the heart is quite intense here. I'm sorry for that. Where the aorta down could be slightly counterclockwise. Okay. So now that's fine. Not too much. Just two or three degrees. And then we go back to biplane. And we now go more posterior and actively engage actually the posterior leaflet, secondarily. You see the spacer. I pull the system up. Stefan, if you can hear us, just describe to yes. us what you're looking for and what you are aligning and um, seeking to achieve with your yeah, fine tuning. What I did, I straightened, I straightened the sheath slightly, so there are some maneuvers. You see that the posterior leaflet is extremely tethered. It may be that I change even the strategy to start posterior. And as you can see, I'm trying to get a straight leaflet. This is, this is the, the situation and the, the, the work that has to be achieved here to get actually a straight leaflet onto the posterior side of the Pascal because we want to touch with the leaflet the spacer that you nicely see in the middle. Do you recognize the spacer? So we try to move up now. 
and I try to elongate the leaflets. Now you see this movement. I'm going more posterior, more posterior, more posterior, and I'm getting the leaflet in the funnel between the lower and the upper clasp. Can you see that? We can see it. Jorg and Stefan, do you have Sound any good? additional comments regarding the manipulation and the, the, the interplay with the imaging? <coughs> well, uh, Stefan shows very nicely this, this way of independent clasping. Um, perhaps so one, one option one could use is also to slightly close the Pascal so that the angle is a little bit easier to, to get underneath this posterior uh, very tethered leaflet. Mm -hmm. We can follow this. We're already slightly close. As you see, we have a V-shape. We have to get space in between to, to actually catch the posterior leaflet. But um, Felix can close slightly. You see that I'm touching one cord there, so which brings me a little bit out. We have to overcome this, uh, but we'll try. And perhaps we'll have to regrasp posterior. So can some some pedal close? Stefan. Stefan. No, no. Stefan, do you think the starting by clasping the posterior leaflet and then moving towards the anterior may help to... That's what we did in the last case. It's also a possibility, of course. The, the posterior leaflet sometimes is weaker and the, the height of the leaflet was different. But it's also a possibility. Perhaps we switch to that. So it depends on what the is easier. the other way around, effectively. Yes. To, yeah. to, to go right. uh, under That's what the tethered we did in the last posterior case. leaflet and then bring it towards the anterior one. Because the anterior yeah, right. is much we more mobile and, and it's, it's working, uh, it's, it's yeah, yeah. moving much easier, then it's probably also easier to That's get underneath. Right. That's a good point. We will do that for the sake of the chairs. No problem. It's the opposite strategy. So the interior class is open. open. I will go with a sort of uh, hard tagging going uh, under the, the posterior leaflet and clasping it. We can go it. a little bit down. And then moving towards the anterior one. Stefan. But it's also a very nice demonstration of the stability of the device in one yeah. position and allowing you the time and the flexibility to change your strategy. And I think that one of the major uh, the major feature that we are uh, uh, seeing is that the device doesn't get entangled into the mm. cord, even with all these adjustments. So we are free now. You this, saw uh, that we were a little, bit, a little bit caught on the, on the uh, medial papillary muscles. So what I did is I elongated the system. You see that the clasps are totally raised. You can appreciate this in fluoroscopy. If yeah. you just uh, put your attention to the fluoroscopy system, I'll just highlight this. You see that the system is much longer now, and that we can also do something like an inverse situation here. We could go out, we could, but we could also directly do this. We just have to get a little bit better trajectory from the, from the puncture side. So we're pulling the system out now, slowly. We're getting, we're in elongated mode. So I'm now getting, can we see it on the left side, please, Tobias? You see, we're totally central there, but the system is, is elongated, so it's not, not in a grasping situation. We have now a nicer, we have now a nicer uh, position here. We're still with the pedals orientated. And I now check the degree of freedom, actually. And I'm going up into the, to the posterior leaflet there. Looks like we're free. I think so, we're free. Can we check it in 3D perhaps shortly? And then we would reclose it 
into the posterior leaflet. So you see the interior leaflet is freely moving. We're slightly posterior. I can, of course, change the position here. And this shows me that I'm totally free. Can you see that? Yep. I can yes. move up and forth. The clasps are up, so we have an elongated system, but I'm more lateral. What I'm doing now with the elongated system, I move back and forth, and now I give a little bit more flex back to the system, moving back and forth, you see? And this shows me that I'm not entangled into any, trip, uh, into any cord, see that? I'm totally free. I can move anterior posterior without a change in trajectory, and the orientation still is good. What we can do now is actually to shorten the system, go back to, to, to biplane, and we now take the position of the spacer, as you can see here, and we'll very slowly actually close into the leaflets. We're free, as we have shown you. We try to be central. So I'm, see that here? And we're concentrating first, as we said, on the posterior leaflets, okay? You see the spacer? Can you see the spacer? I'm moving in a little bit. Yeah. You see the clasp? everything, and Felix is slowly, very slowly, closing the system back again. So we didn't leave the ventricle because we know we're not entangled, we're in the middle. See, now we're getting the interior on and we're again back, moving back into a clasp ready position. I go a little bit deeper because we see the posterior leaflet, it's very long there. Now you close it. I move posterior. Can we get more magnification, please? 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 Can Stefan, while the team in Mainz are concentrating, so is it, is it a 90% echocardiographic? Uh, guided procedure Absolutely. with yeah. fluorine support. On. Yeah, I would say so. I guess it's it's yes. the same as we have for for the mitral clip. So the I on. mean, Stefan von Badelim nicely shows what overlay may mm. be in the future uh, facilitating the procedure. But I think uh, currently, obviously, echo 3D echo is what you what so you need. Absolutely. But, but occasionally using the fluoro just to tell you the yeah. device length and the, the positioning yeah. relative to the apex the and so on? Exactly this yeah. and f uh, for implantation of a second Pascal device you probably would need it. Sure. <clears throat> so how are things going Stefan? You see, we're taking a more interior type uh, of uh, yeah. puncture position as, the, as we are still in the middle of the valve. It looks good, Carmelo. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. yeah. Uh, much more better the, the trajectory. Do the, of we do the posterior first. Same Wait place. a second, we go in a little bit more. Well, the posterior deep in, deep in, deep in posterior, and clasp the posterior, please. No, it's clasped. The posterior is now clasped, moves up and down. We can control this in fluoro. Have a look a bit at the clasp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yeah, sure, yeah, looks good. We go back. So the posterior should be in. And we now try to move forward to the interior, which was the second option we had. And we try to move up, go a little bit interior. Well, bisschen pedals a bisschen aufmachen, slightly. And I'm now bringing back a little bit the cerebral sheath, changing the angulation and increasing the support for the interior leaflet. What's in? Are we happy about the posterior clasp? The posterior clasp, clasp. is it down? It's down, yeah. We're not sure about the... 
Okay. Yeah, now it's on. Wait, wait a second. Uh, now it's on. Yeah, if you have been... Okay. Grun, clasp, mm -hmm. clasp down. Both clasps down. Pedal close. Yes. Okay. Good. Well done. <laughs> okay, good. Fantastic. Congratulations. Okay, it was a, you saw it's a very intense steering process, but we chose a patient with extremely tetal leaflet. You saw a 90 degree angulation to it. So I think uh, even if we have to use a second one device here, it's, it's larger than we thought. I think it's already we're on the medial side, but we have all the space left actually in the central part to now place the second device and to completely treat this situation. And I think it's a very stable, very good situation that I would not uh, give up. So we're, we're heading, we're looking now for the result and we would go if needed for a second device. Looks already perfect, look here. Great. I, I was good. going good. to say, wow. can we have a little walk Very around the, the results? Trace. Trace. Good. We can have a walk around the results. I think we went into the more diseased uh, medial side, and I think I'm very happy with the result with only a single clasp device. Uh, and actually, we treated this, I think, nicely. We saw the effects of a severe tethering of the posterior leaflet, which made it, of course, relatively hard to get the right angulations here, but you could see that you're able to change any of the puncture trajectories into a very positive result. And I think we will get the gradient, which I anticipate to be only two. So if we can get a CV Doppler gradient, please, across the valve. So Stefan, while Tobias is making his uh, imaging... Bella, like it? We like it Bella? very much, but Bella, while Tobias like is doing a comprehensive Good. imaging assessment, we have some questions yes. from uh, our participants. Yes. Are you happy to take some questions? Okay. Absolutely. We're very relaxed here. And we can show you, if we have the time, also the deployment of the Pascal system later. But you see here, we have a sinus rhythm. We have excellent a maximum speed that is around one meter per second. So we anticipate to have something around... Uh, you see, we're even oh, taking yes. the black uh, in the Doppler situation. So I think, yeah, we have 5.3. A very low peak gradient is an indicator of a low, a very low regurgitation of flow that's residual. So we don't have a lot of uh, backflow here anymore, which we also saw in color. So I think as a first grasp uh, result, this is an excellent situation in the severely diseased patient. And he has a huge opening left uh, for further notice uh, and any redo procedure that may come during his life. And have you got any invasive measurement yeah. of LA pressure? We can do that immediately. We would then um, actually revoke the system. We can do the LA pressure on the system during the procedure also. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. So we just simply need a zero, please. A new zero. Look, look at the look at the pulmonary vein flow. It looks uh, perfect. It could, okay. It could very well be that we hit the sweet spot. Yes. With this functional MR. Absolutely. If I'm not fully misca mistaken, to be as the the jet the regurgitant jet was kind of medialized in the beginning. Yes. Is that right? It was. So just to be clear, Stefan and Felix, initially look. you said you might need a second uh, device, but maybe seeing what we've seen now, you think no. one will be sufficient. No, no, we, we showed them the strategy first device, and we have an LA pressure of 10. So you see, with, together with a mean gradient across in the integrate flow from the atrium to the ventricle of 2 to 3, we have an excellent result. An LA pressure of 10 is normal. You can show the, you can show yeah, the pressure. Sure pressure curve, please, Regie. Yes, here, we have the pressure curve, and you see that nicely. Okay. So I think we will we will deploy we will deploy the so device. We check, for we check, and I would go for the final evaluation now. And we check. Actually, I, I think I've seen the leaflets adequately. We would now go to deploy the device. So we cut the security sutures, and we can now concentrate here on the hands of Felix. I will control that the device doesn't rotate. So each slider has a a tether loop. And the concept is now to cut one of the one part of the loop. Never both. One here and one of the other. You see that? Now we open the stop cartridge. 
And now I can very easily pull out the tether that controlled the clasps, like that. Now we remove the security pin, which is located a little bit behind you. It's a blue pin. We'll show this when we remove it slowly. I can show this. Where's the camera? Here's yeah, the camera. A little bit more down. There. This is the security pin. And we now simply unscrew the device. I hold it here, and I will pull it back on the fluoro. We're happy. We'll just get a lot of angulation. We go back to the LAO. So I'm turning this actu actuator wire for 10 times. I think you can easily see that. Perhaps we go a little bit away from the ICD probe. Yeah, this looks better. And you have to focus now on the very radio Please pack. give the, yeah, right, the fluoro. Very good, Regie. Line Perfect. in the very center of the device. And once I've turned more than 10 times, I can now pull it. And under continuous, there so you go. And you see a very stable situation of the Pascal system. So we're nicely secured in the leaflets. And I simply pull the device, and we're done. It's a very nice procedure. We're able to do this, as you see, within the time of the satellite transmission. And I hope uh, you like the result, as we do. So, Stefan, it's a fantastic a result. Congratulations to you Thank both. You. What I'd like you to do is just to Thank summarize that that wasn't an easy case, clearly. Could you just summarize no, the no, key no, steps yeah. for, the, for our uh, observers in, in, from your perspective as the operator? What were the key steps and the key steps that made the difference to the successful deployment? In this case, as we nicely showed, actually, anal restrictive analplicity firsthand was no option for this patient. The second key step is that the independent clasping was one of the keys to success, as well as a very high degree of steerability that was totally independent from the side of our transeptal puncture. Giving a mid to posterior puncture gives you all the possibilities with the combination of the uh, steerable sheath and the steerable catheter actually to reach any angulation to the valve. And this is very important, as Camello also pointed it out, that we're able to support every leaflet with its normal anatomy. And what we had was a very steep and 90 degree to the apex directed posterior leaflet. On the other hand, we had a uh, anterior leaflet, this is the posterior leaflet, the anterior leaflet, which had a totally different trajectory. We first supported more the posterior size and then angulated into a neutral position back to support the interior leaflet. By doing this and by using the two independent clasps, actually we showed you that with the first clasping attempt, we achieved a perfect result from severe mitral regurgitation to trace mitral regurgitation. So I think we showed you the performance potential uh, in experienced hands with this device. So uh, I think a very good device with a spacer. It needs some training, but uh, I think with some training, uh, this is a perfect device uh, to be handled. And we also just have an experience of, at the moment, approximately 16, 17 implants in the mitral and tricuspic position. So you can see it's doable. Well, Stefan and, uh, and Felix, you made it look very straightforward. You look as though you've been doing it for several years, not for several weeks or months. So congratulations to you Three all. Three times today, so... <laughs> Congratulations to you all. We're going to okay. leave you now so that we can share some short cases uh, from our panellists here. But thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, well done. Have a nice ongoing symposium and the best wishes to all the webinar viewers from Mainz, Germany. Thank you very much for having us. And with some nice images from the valve, actually we can get perhaps the inlay of the mitral valve to say goodbye. And you see a very nice opening, so we have more than three centimeters square residual opening in this young patient, and I think this is very beneficial for his future. And we say goodbye from Mainz. That's great. Thank the mitral you. valve is smiling. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Yes, it does. Bye-bye. So we have two short cases now, just to further illustrate the utility of this, uh, this new device. The first is going to be presented by Jörg Hausleiter, and I think this is a degenerative case. Am I right, Jörg? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon again. Um, now we have seen a very nice case with functional MR, 
and how the Pascal uh, system can treat the functional MR. And I'm going to show you a very brief case which we performed a couple of weeks ago on a patient with a primary MR. He is an 85-year-old uh, male patient with shortness of breath, neurocard class 3, and the cause is this primary MR, 3 plus MR, due to the P2 flail leaflet. Obstructive coronary artery disease was ruled out also in February. He has chronic atrial fibrillation and reduced kidney function, also some prostate cancer, and you see also the cardiovascular risk profile almost all risk factors present with arterial hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and also some hypercholesterolemia. Now, when we performed the uh, screening transthoracic echocardiography, you see on the left side the four-chamber view, this eccentric chat um, going to the septum, and also when you rotate the probe a little bit into in the two-chamber view uh, on the right side, you see that there's a pretty broad chat uh, coming from the LV into the left atrium. When we're looking at, in the transesophageal echocardiograms, you see the pathology of this valve. On the right side, you see the flail leaflet of the P2 segment with a flailing height of around 5 millimeters. The width of that segment is around 60 millimeters, as you can depict on the left side. Now, when we went into the procedure, um, we see here now the uh, 3D images of the mitral valve. You see the flailing leaflet on the left side and the se severe um, regurgitant jet on the right side, uh, very eccentric jet as we have seen before. Now you see <coughs> the, very much the same what you have seen in the live case. Um, we orientated the Pascal system very perpendicular to the mitral valve in the A2P2 segment. And you can also see uh, very briefly that the anterior clasp in the right image is moving up and down. This is the clasp check to see when you um, activate one of these levers which corresponds to the anterior clasp and which is, which is the posterior clasp, as we just have seen in the live case. Now we, we went into the left ventricle and tried first and simultaneous grasping of the leaflets, but it was actually more complicated as expected, so that we used this feature for the, of the independent leaflet grasping, which you have seen uh, before by Carmelo. So for, as you see it here in this, um, in this uh, movie, we grasped first the, the posterior leaflet and then the anterior leaflet. And this is what you will see now in the next video loop um, while we <coughs> attempted to grasp the anterior leaflet. Here you see this on the right side in the uh, LV to LVOT view, the posterior leaflet is grasped, and now I'm trying to get the anterior leaflet onto the device. It took uh, so several um, attempts to get to a perfect leaflet insertion. Now you see that the anterior leaflet is on the anterior pedal, and then we also dropped the anterior clasp, as you just have seen. Now this resulted in a very good MR reduction, as you see on, in a second, and the left image you see as right now in the, in the live screen, a uh, live um, um, case, the release of the, un, of the clasp, and then the remaining result, also in this patient, we were able to really reduce the MR to a trace result. And here, very similar to what you have seen before, you see on the left side the 3D image with a 3D um, uh, reconstruction, a broad tissue bridge in the A2P2 segment. And uh, when you look at the right side with the uh, color double of flow, you see that there is um, no, re no jet really coming back to the left atrium, only the broad inflow. And we had a residual gradient of two millimeters of mercury in this patient. So in summary, 
Um, this was, also, as, a, as I wanted to point out, the first commercial patients which was performed worldwide. Um, we had a very successful uh, MR reduction from three plus to, to trace with the placement of a single Pascal um, system in this A2P2 segment. You have seen in the live case, but also in this case, that this independent leaflet capturing um, appears to be beneficial. It allows you to reduce, to improve the MR reduction, but also if you have a suboptimal result, it allows you to optimize the leaflet insertion into the device and by that improving the MR reduction. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jörg. Um, I mean, you've clearly shown that it's feasible in degenerative mitral regurgitation. We've seen a nice case of FMR, and we're going to see another one shortly. But just for our participants, are there any anatomies where it would be contraindicated, do you feel, to use this device, where, where you would have predictors of a bad outcome? Actually, at the current stage, of course, we are in a very early phase. Um, Everybody has just an experience of less than 20 patients, but overall I think that, um, that this device can be applied to all pathologies um, um, which, we, which we treated so far. Maybe we have to, to get more experience in the more commercial um, aspects or commercial P3 um, flates, for example, because of the width um, of the system. But that's something probably what we have to try in the near future. OK, thank you. So we're going to move on to our, our next and final case from Stefan. Yeah, so I, I brought to you a patient who shares some similarities of the patient we just saw from Mainz. It was a young patient uh, with um, functional mitral regurgitation uh, based on dilated cardiomyopathy. The patient, 47 years old, had myocarditis diagnosed in 1995 and over the last 20 years developed uh, worsening of his uh, LV function um, but had a reasonable cardiac index which precluded him from putting him on a transplant list. He was hospitalized over the last 12 months for two, two times and now presented with New York Heart Association class 3. He was on uh, medical therapy according to current standards. He was not a patient for a CRT. Uh, um, implantation and had uh, uh, the following uh, aspects of mitral regurgitation. You see a dilatation of, uh, of the ventricle and uh, the certainly severe functional mitral regurgitation. So we went on to implant uh, uh, the Pascal device and um, went uh, on to implant the first device on a very medial position, as you can see here in the B-commissural view, and uh, the um, uh, site independent uh, lowering of the clasps shows, at least in this slide for the posterior leaflet, that we were not sure about perfect insertion of the leaflet, which uh, then led us to remove uh, the system uh, from the ventricle. And we have seen this before, how this works. Elongation of the system is what you have to do, and, and I felt it very easy to do uh, without any signs of entanglement uh, during this position. So, uh, as I believe, a very important safety aspect of this device. We went then into a more medial, um, a more central position, away from the medial position, as you can see here. Um, this is controlled by fluoroscopy, and you see these, these nice movements of the clasps. Uh, indicating that you have indeed um, uh, grasped the, the leaflets. And then um, uh, we uh, uh, saw uh, this result after implantation of the first clip which, with, with quite some residual mitral regurgitation originating from the very medial part of the line of co-optation. So we decided to implant a second device, uh, which was then implanted medially, which went very well without any entanglement uh, with uh, the first uh, device implanted. And um, this is uh, shown here where you basically see both of, of them aligned together with uh, uh, a, a nice view on these uh, two Pascal devices at the end of the procedure. And if you look at uh, the overall reduction of mitral regurgitation, on the left-hand side you see uh, the, the basic uh, baseline status and, and uh, the result after two devices, we were quite uh, happy with this. 
Wonderful. So thank you very much. It would be nice if we could project the questions from our participants in the few minutes that we have available. Um, Lars, do you have any specific questions yourself? I've got yeah, one I just or two I have um, about this um, the, the independent uh, clasping. So let's say you, as in the case for mine, so the case you showed, you're clasping one leaflet and then try to move it to the other leaflet. Is that implying a, a risk of, of leaflet tearing when you when you do this? Um, well, potentially, of course, there might always be some some risk of doing that. However, we uh, we ha we see that that the this this movement can be controlled very very carefully, and um, that the tension in which you apply um, is not too much um, on the leaf. So if you if you're not if, well. Everything can be torn away, of course, mm -hmm. but if you apply this, this very carefully, then, of course, it can be done very, very safely. So we have some practical questions from our uh, participants. So um, there was a question about the monitoring of the pressure. It wasn't quite clear how Stefan was measuring that. Is it measured through the device, or is there a separate pigtail across the septum? How, how was he doing it? So, so for, this is interesting because for the Pascal device, you indeed have a chance of constantly measuring the LA pressure That's through the I device, yeah. um, which I think is, a, is an advantage, yes. Okay, so you have real-time monitoring of yes. LA pressure through the device. Without having a second pigtail, for example. Exactly, yeah. And then there's a, about the, the uh, positioning and the movements of the catheter. So is it possible to change the the angulation of the catheter in relation to the valve plane. I mean, Stefan was making lots of movements uh, simultaneously, but is, is that something that can be done as a, as a specific movement? Absolutely. This is why the system has its possibility to really move in any direction in the 3D space um, when, you're, when you're in the left atrium. You can, um, and, and Stefan has shown this very, very nicely, really get to different angles above the mitral valve and use this technique to, to capture the leaflets independently than with the, with the Pascal. So yes, you have the possibility to really angulate the system very, very nicely. Okay, and this is a question maybe for all three of you, but I'll put it to Carmelo first. So this is a new device and not many people have got access to it at the moment, but do you think it's a, a device that you can start from scratch or is it one that you have to have experience already with mitroclip and other transeptal procedures before you, if you like, advance to this new device? What do you think? So you mean uh, if you can start uh, just with a, with a, with a, with a Pascal without having exactly. experience? Uh, yeah. Well, I think yes, you can. Uh, you can even, of course, if you have the experience of lot uh, of hundred of patients treated with the mitral clip, mm -hmm. you already understand the anatomy of the, the valve and how you have to repair that valve. Yeah are respectful of the device that you use to, to approximate the, yeah. the leaflets. I may be asking Stefan and Jorga the, the same question, but in a different way. <laughs> um, do you think this is easier to learn than the MitroClip? Well, this is, a, this is a hard question. I guess for us, the <laughs> feeling is it's, it's much easier to learn because we, we have experience. But even for annuloplasty, it was probably good to have experience with mm -hmm. the MitroClip before. So mm -hmm. I think this is a little bit unfair to say. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, as, as Stefan von Badeleben showed, it's, it's very logically built, the three parts of the system, which, which make it uh, very logical and, and easy to to move in the left atrium, yes. Okay. But I think you also have to say that the more experience you have with any device, it will help you to treat some additional patients. And of course, the more possibilities you have, the more features you have, it makes the system not going to always go easier, but you can use those additional features that in specific patients, where as you, as you have seen today, to really improve this result. And Does it come with a bench like the, with the mitre clip? I mean, look, it looks like it was a two operator procedure here because they, they, they kept the steering system in their hands, so you need to be two people to do it. Can you park it on a bench in a, like the mitre clip where you can do it as a one operator? 
Yes, there, there is um, there, there are different systems supporting also the catheter system. <laughs> Stefan van Wallen has also only used the, the main, the first one where, where it supports the guiding catheter, but there is some additional one which, which you can use also um, to support the steering and, and the implant catheters um, so to make it easier and, and to, to perhaps also use it as a single operator, yes. And a very quick question, a very quick answer, Stefan. Post-operative uh, antiplatelet therapy, single agent, double agent, sinus rhythm patient. The same as for mitroclip. Same as for yeah. mitroclip. So dual antiplatelet yeah, therapy in your practice. Good. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to uh, uh, just conclude, if I may. Uh, I think we've had a very stimulating discussion regarding this new device, which is now commercially available in Europe. Um, we've learnt that uh, mitral regurgitation is common, it's associated with adverse prognosis, and there's clearly a major unmet clinical need for transcatheter therapies to improve upon existing treatments with optimised medical treatment and resynchronisation therapy when applicable. The PASCAL represents a new system uh, which has very uh, clever design features to allow safe and simple delivery and very predictable uh, movement of the, uh, the planes of the catheter and very simple and predictable uh, grasping of the leaflets which can be either done simultaneously or as we saw in the live case with individual leaflets one after the other in sequence. Um, that leaflet capturing is very very precise and with optimized transesophageal echocardiographic imaging uh, a very accurate uh, grasping can be achieved. We've heard the latest clinical data, uh, initial series in 30 patients, the subsequent CLASP registry in another 60, and with expansion elsewhere in Europe and the US, we now have experience in approaching 200 patients. And it's clear from our expert panelists today that they think that this is an attractive new device to the growing field of um, transcatheter mitral therapy. So thank you, Lars, for co-chairing with me. Thank you to our expert panelists. And thank you all for joining us as participants in this webinar. A good evening to you all from Paris.